All right. Welcome back to round two of Tim Donahue Rambles on About Wines. Um, so now we're going to talk about the phenolics of the wines that you guys have in front of you. So you guys have heard this before, but I'm going to go ahead and go over it again. Um, this is wine phenolics. And for me, I always struggled to get it because I don't really have a big background in um, organic chemistry, but I can figure out how to functionally bat these things around. And I think that's the important piece isn't you necessarily have to understand, you know, if you've got a fl you know, flavillium ion or if you've got malvin 3 glucoside or you've got, um, you know, catechin or whatever the species are, or if it's a flavonoid or an isoflavonoid or any of those things, you know, it's really understanding, you know, what are the main components and what are the things that you can do to sort of move those things around. So this is what I see when I see, um, phenolics in a whole, and, and it's kind of a mess um, for, for most of us that don't have OCHEM as a background. But basically what we have here is we have a few things. We've got acetylaldehyde uh, or aldehydes in general, and they're highly reactive with different types of tannin and anthocyanins. And basically what you can do is you can bat tannins around a little bit with simply um, uh, using aldehyde. So depending on what you've got coming in, it helps you to decide how you want to knit things together. We're going to talk about that a little bit next week with oxygen management. But the reason why tannins exist is because they're essentially sunscreen for grapes. So depending on how you want your wine to be, how tannic or not tannic you want it to be, that's all controlled through canopy management in the vineyard. If you think you can fix tannins in the cellar, you are sorely mistaken. It happens in out in the vineyard. So if you wanted to create a highly tannic wine, um, as much as you can from any particular variety, you want to expose those grapes really early on. And most of the time that's early, like right after, you know, fruit set, you know, right while they're little baby green grapes, you want to get those leaves out of the way and get the sun on those grapes. And the reason for that is, is that's what's going to start developing all of these uh, tannin compounds later on down the road. Whereas um, if you wanted to have Sauvignon Blanc where you don't want tannin, you want it soft, you want it silky, you don't want it grippy at all, you want to keep those grapes completely shaded their whole life. Um, and so keep them out of the sun. And that's really how you can bat around uh, tannins. But it doesn't happen later. It doesn't happen through leaf stripping. Almost all of the precursors happen when it's just these little baby green grapes. And if you do that early enough, the fruit will sunburn later. What happens a lot of times is people let the fruit sit kind of shaded. And then at Verasion, they go and pull all the leaves off. And the, these grapes have never seen sun before. And then they get sunburned. So you do it early on. Another thing that cause tannin to increase is just general abuse of the grapes. So things like chopping off some of the cluster, raking them, but uh, crop thinning in a traditional sense doesn't necessarily move them around a whole lot. If you thin the cluster itself, you'll have a lot more uh, impact on tannins than just going off and, and dropping fruit. And if you drop fruit uh, after veraison, it's all you're doing is throwing it on the ground. It's not doing anything to increase your tannin uh, concentration. So, the reason we're doing this is to make these grapes beautiful and dark and, and white grapes are actually uh, a mutation. Uh, red grapes are the kind of natural uh, creation. And the reason for that is, is we're trying to attract birds. And so everything that's functionally happening in a grape is to make a bird want to eat it. And so we're making sugar. Sugar is what you like. It's what I like. Want to eat it. Um, and then we've got to get the grapes trying to get rid of acids. So, you know, as you're ripening, acid's going down, acid's reducing, it's going down, 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 and sugar's going up, 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 up. And that's going to make the bird want to eat it. But a bird isn't going to eat it if it can't see it. And so it's, uh, the coloration is the signal to the bird to come eat it. And the reality is, is that's what birds need to do is they need to, they need to, grapes need to do, they need to be eaten by a, a bird and then pooped out and that seed gets scarified in the process and then it can grow. Um, so uh, pretty interesting, but that's the reality of what grapes are. And so we intervene in that process uh, to make wine. So let's go through line by line uh, on some different phenolics that we're going to look at. We're going to look at just the basic core uh, phenolics. There are a lot more. There's thousands of them. We're just going to do the basics that are easy to measure, that will be easy for you to understand. So tannins are flavonoid polymers found naturally in grape skins and seeds. They greatly affect mouthfeel in red wines and are responsible for much of red wine body and astringency. They are the backbone of a red wine. Tannins have a strong affinity for oxygen and confer oxidative stability to red wines. And so if you look at tannins in the literature, this is what it you know, says the tannins are. But here's really more what it is. It's just a big old mess. It's a big old mess of thousands of different compounds stacked on top of each other, smashed together. 
And, uh, you know, there's aldehydes, there's just bridging, there's sugars that stick things together. Everything sticks something together, and it's just a big old muck of knitted up tannins. But this is the way I like to think of tannins, is it's just a bunch of Legos. And so it's a big old pile of things that you can use to build something. And so the question is, really, what do you want to build? And so depending on the variety that you're working with, you can build something totally different. This is like Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir just doesn't have a lot of tannin. It's just sort of the nature of the beast. Well, it can have a bit of tannin if you grow it in a hotter climate, but that doesn't stylistically fit Pinot. So you grew it in a cold climate, and because there's not a lot of sun, there's not a lot of exposure, there's not a lot of phenolic uh, compounds to work with. So, so Pinots, um, you're going to have a lot less structure to work with, and because of that, you're going to have a lot less ability for a... So if you think of in between every one of those Legos, uh, is an aldehyde sticking it together. It's kind of like the glue sticking it together. So um, you don't need A and a lot of aldehyde. And if you do get a lot of aldehyde in a Pinot, you've got nothing there to bind it up. So, you know, Pinot Noirs are not really ideal candidates for microoxing, adding tons of oxygen. You really make them a lot more like a, a white wine. You do, you just sort of are very careful with them because you don't want to accidentally overexpose them to too much oxygen. And then you end up with a, a, a dead flat wine. And then this is Cabernet. This is the other side of things. So Cabernet has a, you, you've got a lot more tannin. You've got a lot more phenolics to work with. You've got a lot more uh, to, to, to work with. And I think also maybe you could call it Petit Verdot in this. And, and um, you know, a lot of the Bordeaux varieties really bring a lot more to the table. You just have more tannin to work with. So you can choose actually to make a very light red. You just don't use all of it. You press it early. You can make like a rosé or something like that. You can leave, you know, you don't have, you, once you got the big Lego kit, you don't have, you can make something small out of it, or you can build the whole beast. And the thing is, is in order to build that, you've got to put the, the systems in place to make that happen. And a lot of times that requires that sort of aldehyde bridging. And so that comes through, you know, the microox, the mesoox, uh, certain types of yeast produce a lot of it. That's why I use a lot of QA23. Uh, QA23, uh, I did a bunch of yeast trials in my master's program, and uh, QA23 happened to make a tremendous amount of aldehyde. And uh, for whatever reason, and left it behind the wine. So it's, it's funny because it's thought to be a white wine yeast, but really um, it might be better suited as a red because of all the aldehyde. And that just really helps to knit sort of things together. So when we take a look at the actual amount of tannin in each of these wines, I think it's pretty interesting to see how we've evolved here. And I'm, I'm not going to joke here that it was not unusual for our Cabernets and Merlots to have 300 milligrams liter, liter of tannin back in 2016. Um, and, uh, before that, you know, 2015, we had pretty similar numbers to, to what we do here, but 2015 was just so hot and, uh, that hot year, high UV year, um, it was inevitable to end up with some pretty high tannin wines. So, um, given that this was a really moderate year, we've got really moderate levels of tannin. So as we taste through the Carmenere is the lowest as usual, almost always is. And I think a lot of that's because we pick early and then the Malbec, Cap Franc, Merlot and Petit Verdot are all pretty similar. And I thought that was really interesting, just seeing that consistency through the vineyard. And then, of course, the Cabernet Sauvignon is the big boy at the end. And it, it probably tastes that way. It's got the most building blocks, um, and that's probably good for Cabernet. But remember that sort of tannin number, because next week when we get into fining, I'm going to be doing our, our fining, all the fining trials I'm going to ship out and do on the Cab Sauv. So, <laughs> anthocyanins. Um, this is your color. Uh, essential for good color in rind. Color change, uh, changing color based on wine pH. The lower the pH is, the brighter red it is. And you know that. You fundamentally know that. When it's a low pH, you feel your mouth water, you feel that sourness, you can see a bright red cherry, your, your, your tongue already starts to tingle a little bit. Whereas if you think a big, you see a big super purple plum, um, it's almost blue, you know it's not going to be uh, very acidic because uh, Mother Nature isn't very creative and uses the same uh, anthocyanins in, in blueberries as it does in grapes and plums and everything else, or even cabbage. So um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you ever make sauerkraut with red cabbage, you'll know it's ready when it turns bright red because the pH is low enough. Um, things are, is anthocyanins are very labile. They go away really quick and they're highest early in the fermentation. They decline during fermentation and aging pretty quick, uh, about 50% a year. Uh, things you can do to slow them down um, are... Uh, you know, add more SO2. SO2 will slow down your anthocyanin degradation. However, it bleaches them. So yeah, it slows down the anthocyanin degradation, but then you can't see the anthocyanins. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a double-edged sword there. 
Um, and at the same time, you know, those anthocyanins are something that we're going to want to use as a tool to, to knit up our tannin structure. So the way I think of anthocyanins is more like Lego pirates. I think more accurately, the thing to use would be uh, just the flat edged Legos that don't have uh, another side to them. But I like uh, pirates because they're cuter, they're colorful, and they're more fun. The reason why we want to use that, the, the pirates or the, the sort of flat Legos is the anthocyanins are what we call a terminal unit. Once you glue an anthocyanin onto the end of the tannin, it blocks all the pro a lot of the protein reactive sites on your tongue and it'll smooth that tannin out. So anthocyanins are very useful for that. Um, but they're also the, you know, the core of our colorfulness. So let's take a look at our anthocyanin numbers here. And um, you can see that the Malbec is astronomically high compared to the rest. And it was coming in, it was much higher than all of the other ones. And then we have a little less than the Carmenere, a lot less than the Cab Franc, uh, Merlot, Petit Verdot has some, and then the Cab Sobs back up close to the Carmenere. But I'm going to be willing to bet you that the cab saw doesn't look quite the reddest necessarily, probably because it's high pH. That's going to shift it uh, into a little bit more of the blue color. And then um, Malbec is probably going to be the most vibrant of the bunch, except for it's a little bit bleached. Cab Franc's probably getting a little help, uh, and Merlot are getting a little help on their color because the SO2 is so low in those samples. Um, but uh, I think it's a probably a really interesting uh, study to look at, um, knowing kind of the background on these. But um, I want to move on to the next thing here. And the thing I want to move on to with this is that free SO2. So if we take a look at this, um, you can see that the free SO2 in the Cab Sauv and Malbec are quite a bit higher than the Cab Franc and Merlot. So as I was talking about, um, it's a real possibility that the Petit Verdot has a lot of color to it. Probably looks really, really dark, really, really inky. That's because it has a moderate amount of anthocyanins, but its SO2 is quite low. Um, so uh, just a, a good way to, to, to mess around with the color in wine is uh, your SO2 levels. So just be very cognizant of that. And a lot of winemakers are, are choosing to go to bottle with lower and lower SO2s um, to maintain that, that vibrancy in that color. Um, because if you go to bottle with 50 or 60 parts per million of free SO2, you'll end up uh, making your wine kind of turn brown and it looks flat. So SO2 is a very powerful uh, tool for uh, uh, moving your uh, color around. And I also want to talk about uh, the, the color and the pH and anthocyanin. So because the um, Malbec, I think in this instance, is quite a bit lower pH, uh, you know, closer to that 3.7 number, it's probably a little bit redder. Um, and then we get into the, the Cab Sob with a lot of tannin, high SO2, it's probably a little bit browner in hue. Um, it's probably looking a little bit more brown. Um, we don't have any really low pH reds in here. Some Barbera, throwing some Barbera in here would be pretty hilarious to see that vibrant red come out. But um, if you wanted to kind of go down the line from low to high, you know, you'll see Barberas in that 3.3 three to 3.4 three, range pretty regularly. Um, and then once we get into that pH, high pH 4.042 range, that's moving more into that sort of uh, rocks uh, kind of coloration. So just realize how um, the, the, the color can move around. And so here's just putting pH in perspective. Uh, just looking at that low pH in the Malbec and um, just seeing the higher pH in the Petit Verdot and the Cab Sauv. And just see if you can compare that to the chart. Feel free to pause the video, go back, compare that chart to the wines and see if you see that. <clears throat> okay, moving on to catechin and epicatechin. Uh, these are just two easy to measure um, uh, compounds that are a, uh, that, that show how seedy a wine is. So basically they're easily extractable from the seeds. Both compounds are found in really high concentrations in seeds and stems and may be found in the skins of immature grapes. Um, Pinot Noir has much higher concentrations of both compounds than Cabernet Merlot or Zinfandel. As grapes mature, the phenolics on the seed surface combine from other compounds to form a seed coat. It's kind of an oxidative reaction that happens and it, it creates the lignification. As a result, uh, seed phenolics become increasingly difficult to extract as seeds mature. Catechin and epicatechin are generally lower in wines made from grapes with riper, more developed seeds. So the primary reason we are concerned about this is it's a good measure to look at in the vineyard. If we have a wine with too little catechin or epicatechin, we might want to add some because it's kind of, because this is really kind of a building block of tannin. 
these uh, catechin and epicatechin are something that we can choose to add back to the wine because in some wines, they're really low and some are quite high. So some wines um, can range from pretty low numbers to a whole lot. A uh, Nebbiolo can be in the 400 milligram a liter range, which is really seedy. And so when you get really seedy wines, catechin and epicatechin are uh, kind of the pokey edges on a tannin, if you want to put it that way. And they give dustiness, you know, a dusty component to the wine. But epicatechin and uh, catechin, these seed tannins, also can help to solubilize anthocyanins and things like that. So the reason we want to look at these and fruit numbers on the uh, incoming is if we have really, really, really low numbers of catechin and epicatechin, and Syrah and Malbec are kind of that way, um, sometimes see, uh, stim inclusion can be an important piece because stims have a lot of these compounds in them. Um, and then sometimes in Pinot Noir, if you're trying to build some sort of structure, you've got very little catechin, very little color, some, some stims can come into play to help build some tannin and structure. Um, but you've got to be really careful with that as to not over extract. And so the way I like to think of catechin and epicatechin is they're kind of the foundation. Um, they're the piece that you build wine off of. They're the, the pieces that are start out as tannin. And so they're all the little tiny monomers that knit up to become overall tannin. And that's the big old, they're the little guys that are that mashed up mess of tannin. And so we like to look at this because it also gives us a good matrix of how our vineyard is maturing and are we picking at the right time and should we be changing when we pick. I'm gonna talk about some things uh, as we taste through these wines that I'm looking at uh, kind of changing uh, on how we approach these wines. So we take a look at these numbers. You look at the Carmenere, Malbec, and Cap Franc. Our Carmenere is always really low. So the Carmenere, because we're always trying to get a little green, a little funkiness, you know, we, we really look at, um, trying to, uh, you know, maybe add a little bit of stim inclusion to it. The Malbec can as well, but there's enough there to hold it. But if we were down around two or something like that, we'd want to consider it. The Cab Franc is remarkably low. It's really surprising to me with the tannin numbers in this, that the Cab Franc is that low. But I think we held it out. We hung it for quite some time. And I think that's sort of reflective in the 15 and a half percent alcohol that it's at. And so, you know, we were letting it ripen, letting it get a little riper. Our Merlot tends to be pretty seedy. Um, because Merlot likes to sugar right and fast. So it kind of matures a little bit early. You know, um, I think I, I might be, you know, resemblant to that, you know, when I was six foot three at 13 years old, you know, uh, I looked a lot more mature than I really was. And, and, and Merlot can definitely be that way. Um, and so a lot of times Merlot, if you want to go for more of that blockbuster style, you can let it hang out for a little bit longer and then water back and acid out. But one of the things that Joel's been working really hard on, I'm really proud of him on, is, is trying to get these numbers to start to fall in line where we're getting a, you know, a physiological ripeness at the same time as we get uh, sugar ripeness. And I think a lot of that comes through crop loading and things like that. So one of the things that we can do in the Merlot, I think, is uh, kind of crop it up a little bit. And that's why we hang a little heavier crop out there is to slow that sugar uh, increase and slow that acid degradation down a little bit and hopefully speed up the, you know, allow the phenolics to come into their own because phenolics are really set more on a timeline. So basically, you know, your, your timeline for picking on phenolics has a bit to do with heat and the conditions it's in, but it really has to do with bloom to pick date. And we see our bloom to pick dates being pretty similar on our Merlot. It's like around 110 days, uh, give or take a couple of days here or there. So we start the clock the second we see bloom. And um, so our hope is that we can always let it go just a little bit longer without getting too ripe. And Merlot will shoot sugar ripe on you, which is the polar opposite of Petit Verdot. Because Petit Verdot does the complete opposite. It shoots phenolic ripe really easy, but it'll do it with 12 and a half, 13 grams liter acid. Um, and so with Petit Verdot, we're always waiting for the acid to come down and fall in line um, in order to, to be able to pick it. And our Cab Sauv's, uh, I think, fairly in balance. Um, this is a little bit more of a, a, a modern style, um, you know, actually a more classic style, I should say. This isn't like the Blockbuster Parker wines that kind of came out through the mid-2000s. This would be a really classic, you know, mid-90s Cabernet uh, in terms of style with a little bit of catechin, a little bit of greenness, and a little bit of herbalness. However, uh, discussion we're having right now with both Merlot and Cab Sauv, because we have big blocks, is splitting it into two picks, doing one at, where we pick it, you know, right at sugar and acid ripeness, and then letting the other one go up to like 30 bricks. And then we can get two different pick times and, and start to look at how that uh, affects how we make the wine. So 
A catechin tannin index is basically an indicator of ripeness. It varies by variety. Uh, the reason why we look at this is very helpful in things like Pinot Noir, Grenache, and Syrah to, disturb, to determine if skin inclusion is helpful. So what we're doing is we're looking at a ratio of how much catechin is there, how much green stuff is there to big, burly, gnarly tan. And so in this case, the wine that's the most seedy is our Merlot because it was a little bit greener because it's, it's the variety that tends to go sugar ripe a little bit quicker. And then the least seedy is our Cabernet Franc. And so that Cabernet Franc shouldn't be seedy at all um, in terms of, of seed type tannin. Um, but that being said, uh, the Cabernet Franc doesn't have a lot of color to help smooth things out. So I'm going to bet it still has a, a fair bit of grip to it, but it's not necessarily because of the the amount of tannin, it's just that there wasn't a whole lot there to polymerize. And when we, we, we go into polymeric anthocyanin and tannin index, we'll see that. Um, and then uh, the Petit Gardot and Cab Sauv, these are all kind of fairly normal, but you can see that these wines, the, the Carmenere, Malbec and Cab these wouldn't be good uh, candidates for optical sorting or anything like that. These are wines we definitely want to leave a little bit of stim in. The Merlot, we could definitely consider uh, sorting or cleaning up if we wanted to back some of that off a bit. So pretty interesting. And then the Petit Verdot and Cab are just right in line, right where we want them. All right, polymeric anthocyanins. Uh, we've talked about this. There's a lot of sources of aldehyde. Yeast make it. We can get it through MOX. You can actually legally add it uh, in the juice phase. Um, and uh, you can just buy aldehyde and pour it in your wine. Um, and uh, I don't recommend it, but you can do it. Um, and uh, also we see those aldehydes in barrel. I mean, that I thought was really cool last week when we were going through the barrels, just seeing that, uh, you know, those, those uh, aromatic aldehydes just getting sucked into the, the wine. Um, so basically what happens is when colored forms of anthocyanins are combined with grape or wine polymers, they are significant contributors to color expression and color stability. So another thing about polymeric anthocyanins too is regular anthocyanins, remember we talked about how they bleach them and they're really affected by pH. Well, once they're polymerized and they're stuck together, um, they become less colorful, a little less colorful, um, but uh, they're still colored and they're very stable. Uh, once they're stuck together, the, 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 the piece of the anthocyanin that sticks out that can be affected by the, the glucose that can be affected by um, the, the, the pH or SO2 bleaching, once they're stuck together, that, that doesn't happen anymore. So even though the, the, the wines are polymerized and they're less colorful, the color that you do have is much more stable. And also the more modified we have on a wine, the more modification we have, the less astringent it is. And so here's what I like to think about it. So here's your tannin and your tannin sitting there. And if you were to lick a Lego, you could feel how that would be rough on your palate. But if we put our little pirate on top, or more fundamentally, let's think about those smooth Legos that we put on the outside. So if we have something like Malbec or Syrah, where we have an infinite sink of color, infinite sink, um, you know, if you've done it right, um, you have a huge amount of anthocyanins to glue all over the tannin. So you think about kind of licking that building is really smooth. And so you can use all that color to polish up your tannins. And so this is why in some varieties, you can throw a little stem in there, which is kind of that seedy nature, which can give a wine astringency. But when you have enough anthocyanins to still polish that up, that's a choice you can do to build more tannin, build more structure, build a bigger wine without building astringency. Now, on the other hand, you have Nebbiolo. And Nebbiolo is all catechin. It has no color. It literally does not have anthocyanins. Um, the color that's there is its own little creature. So that's why when you look at, at Nebbiolo, it's kind of brown and orange because it's pure tannin and there is no color. And so Nebbiolo is the opposite. It's one that you really kind of need to get a lot of that stim and things out because you're just looking at this really, really pokey edged um, uh, beast that has, you know, all these uh, sort of protein reactive sites sticking out. Again, because there's no terminal end units, there's no anthocyanins to polish up those ends. And you pour that wine on your palate, you're going to get a lot of grip and a lot of astringency. And I think the, 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 the best examples in our, our kit today are going to be the Malbec and the Cab Sauv. The Cab Sauv, uh, we didn't have time. We got robbed of the opportunity to knit it up because the, um, the Mallow shot too fast. Uh, and, uh, so I think we, we are going to look at that opportunity is like, Oh, how could we have fixed that? Could we do something different in the future? And so 
perhaps we will not just dump Carmen Yer Lees in willy-nilly for fun. So we take a look at our polymeric anthocyanins, and you see the Malbec is absolutely the highest. And that's, of course, it, of course it is. It had the most to begin with, it had the most anthocyanins. If you start out with the most, you're going to end up with the most polymeric. But I think what's really important about this isn't necessarily a matrix of how much you have, it's a, a, how much you have as a relationship to your tannins. So if you have a whole lot of uh, polymerized uh, anthocyanins and they're coating the outside of that tannin really, really well, um, that means that you've got a, a smoother wine. So it's all about the ratio. Because if you have, uh, you know, if you had 56, uh, you know, polymeric anthocyanins, that means nothing. If you have 56 polymeric anthocyanins, you know, polymeric anthocyanins, and you've got like, 56 uh, tannin, that wine's going to be just squish and soft. Um, so it's all about the ratio between the two. But this definitely lets us know that we had a few things. Number one, you can tell that we definitely had some mox in the Malbec, the Merlot, and Petit Verdot. The Cab Franc absolutely did, but it didn't have much color to begin with. And this was a concern we had when we pulled the Cab Franc and we were looking at the tannin numbers. It happened again this year, is that the Cab Franc, we have to deliberately pull back. It would be the most tannic wine in here for sure. It had more tannin than the Cabernet Sauvignon, but we made a very deliberate choice when we made the Cabernet Franc to not extract it all the way out. If we would have taken it all the way out to full extraction, uh, we would have still ended up with this many polymeric anthocyanins because that's all the anthocyanins we have. But if we would have ended up with a thousand milligrams a liter of tannin, this wine would just be brutal. And so this is the challenge with, cab with, with certain varieties that are high tannin, low color, like Nebbiolo, that you've got to you either extract it or you've got to decide to pull back. And so looking at those numbers on the front end, let us know that we should probably go ahead and uh, not press it uh, too extreme. So here we go. And this is kind of showing you this idea of that ratio. And so the Malbec, not a lot of tannin, moderate amount, lots of polymeric anthocyanins. That wine should be very soft. Anything approaching a 0.1 uh, polymeric anthocyanin tannin ratio is, is pretty squishy. Um, when we look at the Cab Sauv and the Cab Franc, the Cab Franc's, Cab, Cab Sauv's probably going to taste a little bit more stringent just because it has more tannin total and the ratio is pretty similar. But the Cab Franc probably got a little bit of grip to it. But that's okay. I like that in Cab Franc. I think the goal is to just get it in balance and get it right. Um, and I think Cab Franc really shows its best when it's a little bit, a little bit raw, a little bit herbal, a little tea-like. And I think that that looks really well. And then as, as far as Merlot and Petit Verdot, these are really nice numbers. Uh, 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 is really where I like to see wines. Uh, you've got this nice balance between structure and intensity, um, but at the same time, you've got, um, uh, you know, a nice, uh, you know, tannin mouthfeel to it. Um, and then the Cab Sauv on the bookend is probably a bit astringent, but that's something we can modify and look at. And so there are things we can do to change and mask things like that if we, if we choose to. You don't have to. Um, but uh, pretty interesting. Uh, nonetheless, I thought it was a pretty cool little look. So in summary, we always got to give a shout out to ETS for giving us all this analysis. Um, Phenolics are the backbone of any red wine. Uh, knowing levels helps to understand extraction and farming practices. If you don't know what you're bringing in, then how do you know if you're farming right? And so what we've done in the past, and I, maybe I'll try to remember and write myself a note right now, that um, I've done phenolic reports in the past where um, uh, what we do is we take the phenolics and the sugar and everything else and see what vineyard's delivering the most to us. It's a pretty easy thing to do. It's a smart thing to do. Uh, and it allows you to um, uh, make some vineyard valuation reports. And so a lot of times people will say, hey, this vineyard's amazing. It's awesome. You know, best vineyard ever. But then you bring it in, you're like, yeah, I don't know about that. So I mean, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus for negative, but we, we've definitely pulled away from a few. But I can tell you a couple that are, are way over delivering for the price. And uh, Eritage Vineyards is way over delivering. They're delivering a thousand milligram a liter tannin fruit uh, at a very moderate price. And then uh, Summit View Vineyard also, uh, both of those have been very, very good about um, delivering a, a very impressive amounts of tannin uh, for, for a moderate price. Um, just kind of interesting stuff. So. Um, I want to talk about more about modifying phenolics over the next couple of weeks. This is a good primer. I think we saw how oak has that influence. I think we're going to see just kind of overall what, what phenolics mean. This is a, a kind of a, a level one. Then we'll level up over the next couple of weeks uh, looking at fining. 
How do we remove them? And then how do we modify them with uh, oxygen? And then hopefully towards the end, we can talk about how we uh, can do other dirty tricks to, to, to fix things up. So questions, comments, otherwise, let's chat during the masterclass uh, this evening or on Tuesday if you guys get a chance. Cheers.